My name is Rondalyn Korlak. Hi, this is Scott Brinker. I'm Michael Brenner. Hi, this is Scott McCain. What's up, peeps? My name is Keenan. Hello, this is Anthony Fasano from the Engineering Management Institute. My name is Rachel Fish. Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Panara. And you are listening to the Visible Expert. Visible Expert. Visible Expert Podcast. Hi, I'm Kelly Waffle. And you're listening to the Visible Expert Podcast. My guest today is Cornelia Gamlin. Cornelia is an award-winning author who has written books on human resources, management, conflict resolution, and affirmative action. She is also a consultant and speaker and is passionate about helping organizations develop and maintain respectful workplaces. Cornelia, welcome to the Visible Expert Podcast. Thank you, Kelly. I'm delighted to be here. Hey, first of all, congratulations on your award from from the Next Generation Indie Book Awards. Can you uh, take a couple minutes and tell me about it? We were told about this award a couple of years ago by our literary agent, and she had suggested that we we enter our, our most recent book, The Manager's Answer Book, into it. And we we decided to do that this year and figured, well, it might be a little bit of a long shot, but we did and were delighted a couple of months later, I think it was in early May, that I got an email on Saturday morning saying, congratulations, we've announced uh, the winners and the finalists and this year's awards. And you can scroll down through the email and see where, you know, see where your book is. And lo and behold, we were a winner in the category of career books, which uh, just got us really, really excited. This award is the largest independent book award uh, that is um, granted globally. So they accept nominations from all over the world. And it, it's really a pretty big deal. We were, we were very excited and very honored actually quite humble to, to be um, to be recognized on such a large stage and our our agent who who's also been involved as a as, as a coordinator and she's a um, a consultant a literary consultant to the awards was telling us she said it's the most magical event that she goes to every year and of course this year we couldn't go because they they just did a virtual award, it was, you know, but but they did a very good job with the ceremony. But hopefully we will get to come next year. They said they were going to invite the the 2020 winners to the, to the 2021 award ceremony. Well, maybe that's more motivation to keep you writing more books. Well, it certainly is, and we've got a plan for it actually. Okay. <laughs> and I think we'll probably talk about that before we're done. But yes, it, it would be wonderful to be able to to be there and, and be acknowledged in person. But it's still a big honor, you know. Um, I, I just hope you know we're not. Um, they don't overlook us next year because we've already been a winner. Maybe we can win in a different category next year. There you go. Well, still, congratulations to you and Barbara. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, here at Hinge, we define recognized influencers who share their expertise and experience in the B2B and professional services spaces as visible experts. Uh, This podcast, in fact, is focused on sharing the stories of our guests, such as you, and illuminating the challenges and rewards to building a personal brand. Cornelia, I know that you and Barbara have written many helpful HR and business books together. How uh, did you build up your following and get people to see you as a visible expert? Well, I think with both of us, we had opportunities, um, even when we were inside organizations and corporate roles, um, to to, um, to let people see, you know, what, what it was that we could do, what contributions we could make to, to the organizations in, in the different areas that we worked in. Um, I had spent a number of years working with Computer Sciences Corporation uh, in, in, in the Northern Virginia area, and I, I know the company has morphed into a, some, other, some other brands and, and um, gone through some mergers and acquisitions since I've left. But yeah, it, it was a it was a really good opportunity to to gain visibility. I, w- I was in a corporate role, and started. I, I think it was there that I was able to begin building up that 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 personal credibility that I had. Um, you know, I was often the go to person for things. But beyond that, you know, I mean, yes, inside the organization, you know, I used to do a lot of training. I, I got a lot of visibility. 
But my company and my boss supported me a lot in doing anything externally. So I, I got to be, or I got to play some roles within the Society of Human Resource Management and really expand my professional exposure, if you will. Um, got to build a good network of, of other HR and business professionals along the way. And that gave me opportunities, you know, to do more speaking, to do more writing, um, you know, and, and just to, to, to gain access to more colleagues and to build up, you know, a really strong collegial network that, that I still enjoy. I mean, I still, you know, stay in touch with so many folks that, that I knew. Um, and, you know, we've all gone on to do a lot of, a lot of other things, but, but taking a lot of the, a, a lot of those experiences helped me when I decided to move out of a corporate role and, and go off and start consulting for myself uh, or, or building my own firm. And that was such a thrill because now I got to meet other people. I got to learn about other industries uh, or, or at least different companies and get to speak to, to more managers, to more HR people. Had a lot of opportunities to come in and do training or to help other organizations solve some of their problems. And, and I always used to joke with a lot of my HR colleagues in, in these companies and say, you know, you know as much about this issue as I do. And they'd go, yeah, but when we bring somebody in from the outside, you know, we don't know if it's just because we're spending extra dollars, but for some reason they listen to, you know, they'll listen to an outsider. And, you know, sometimes I feel bad about that because I'd go, well, you know, I used to be the, you know, on the inside, but then I realized, yeah, I, I did a lot of internal consulting too in, in the role that I had. But but it was a it was a good way to just to start to be able to influence people not not just within the HR community but within the management community as a whole um, you know to, to talk to other managers and to hear what what their problems and their issues were you know what, what were the things that kept them up at night yeah I think you bring up a, a great tip there as far as becoming a visible expert so a lot of people you know do a lot of blogging and things like that, or they're seen as the subject matter expert within their organization. But uh -huh. I, I think if you can dip your toe in the water and go out a little bit further and start speaking at, at local events, you know, tie into associations and, and networking events, and then expand beyond that, uh, you're really gonna broaden your audience and that's how you're gonna generate a lot of followers. And like you say, you will get into conversations with people that you wouldn't necessarily get if you were blogging or doing a webinar or things like that. So uh, the speaking opportunity route is, is I think a very important one. A lot of people may not be comfortable with it at first, um, but over time you get a little bit more comfortable. And you know the, the beauty of all that I think really comes in when the, the questions, the live questions come at you. So that's where you can really show, you know your subject matter expertise, your thought leadership, and that's where you, you build a connection that you're not going to build through these other channels. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, I always used to enjoy, well, you know, speaking on two levels. I mean, I, I did a lot of training with organizations and, you know, j just to go in and here's a brand new audience. And, and you're right, you, you never quite knew what was going to com come at you, and, you know, because Oftentimes I had the opportunity to say, okay, let me learn a little bit more, you know, because you, you always want to do this, learn more about the organization, learn what their policies and practices are before you go in and start talking to them. But but at the same time, you know, you, you're not living and breathing inside of that organization. So so it's kind of this two-way street, you know, they're looking to you to, to get a, you know, like a broader uh, example. Um, something you know to bring something to them from from outside of what their organization is, and yeah, and and, and to answer some of those tough questions, and, yeah. and you know sometimes that's the that's the hardest part because you don't know what they're going to throw at you, and and you know I can say I'm very fortunate. I, I think I, I can only remember one time I was really blindsided by somebody, and he he clearly had a chip on his shoulder about an issue, but you know you, you usually you can you know you can relate to them and 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 it it is a nice thing when when you're doing something in person because you've got that it's a two way um exchange so and and 
you can sort of read their body language and see what's going on. And, and, and they you. So, you know, like if you're totally stunned by a question, it's going to show. But, you know, if you can quickly recover, even if you are blindsided a little bit. Well, I think initially, as you said, speaking um, is never really, it, it doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. In fact, I, I remember in high school once almost passing out when I had to stand up in front of the class. But I, rem I remember the, one of the first times that I, I spoke just in, in my company, and it was to my HR peers, but a lot of them didn't know me that well because I was new to the role. I mean, I, I was scared to death, and, you know, I used to try to hang behind the, the podium. So I <laughs> and, and, and I'm not a very tall person, so that was always a little bit of a challenge for me. But, you know, it, it just it kind of took a while to – to warm up to it and you know and I think one of the things that helped me is when I started doing some training you know you would we would go out to different sites in the organization well you were delivering the same training program over and over again so it's like you got more and more comfortable with the material the other thing that that was helpful to me was being you know being able to go out and talk about you know like a new program that I've developed um, it I found that, you know, the challenge was kind of behind the scenes in doing a lot of the research and, and putting things together. Um, but w once you did that, you now had the confidence that, hey, I know a lot more about this than anybody in the audience knows. And I think another another tip that I learned, I mean, the first time I, I was doing a presentation and I forgot to talk about something that I had every intention of talking about. And, you know, I, I was beating myself up afterwards. And then I said, well, wait a minute. They didn't know what you were going to be taught. They didn't know you left something out. It isn't like you had, you know, a prepared speech that everybody had a copy of. So um, it, it's, you know, it's time and it's practice. It, it's, build, it's, it's building the confidence within yourself that, you know, that, that you can do it. But once you know that, hey, I really know this topic and, and I know it well. You know, you you can uh, it, you you can kind of master anything. It's just like, just don't try to take on too much. You know, don't don't try to be the the, the jack or Jill of all trades. You know, ma ma or at least master one thing at a time is what I found. No, that's that's good as well because you know I do know a lot of people that try to take on too many things. Um, uh -huh. So you're you're absolutely right. That's that's great advice as people make you know take on their own journey. So. I've talked about your challenges. What's been one of your greatest rewards along the journey? I think it's been the opportunity to meet a lot of people, a lot of colleagues, and to be in a position to influence them, to, to share um, what I've learned. You know, and, and again, I, I, I don't claim to be the guru of all things HR, but the things that I do know and the things that I've studied and, and really delved into, I know that those are things that I know well, and they're things that I can share with other people. Um, and and that, that always gives me really some great joy that <clears throat> I've been able to influence people and influence them in a positive way and, and, and share some things along the way. You know, it, it's, you know, yeah, it, it's great when people recognize you as an, in fact, I remember going, going to an event not too many years ago and it, it was after I moved here to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and, and this young man was introducing me to somebody. And he's got, she's an author. I mean, his eyes were like glazed over. And I was like, oh, I remember when I was his age you know? <laughs> and just starting my HR career. But but it, it's like, you know, it, it, it it's so nice to get that recognition, but it, it's also nice that, that they see you as a peer. And and I think to me that that's more important than saying, this is award-winning author. Yeah, that's a thrill. That that's a charge. But you know, I I, I really want to help people, and and I, I want to share with them. I, I hear that a lot from uh, folks that I interview. Is they really get great joy out of almost like paying it forward. They learn <laughs> things along the way that really help them out, and now they want to influence and help guide folks where they can. So absolutely, yeah. Great to yeah. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit, Cornelia. Um, we do a lot of research here at Hinge, and uh, one of our focus areas is around the employer brand. Uh, our followers are very interested in how a brand 
can help or hinder the acquisition and retention of talent. Uh, what do you see are, are some of the top employee retention risk factors out there? I think for companies and organizations um, to attract talent, and, and especially these days because it's such challenging times, um, you want to be able to, A, have a culture that people want to come to work with. And, and when we look at particularly the younger generations and, and you know, you're going to have to focus a lot of effort there because they, they're the future. You know, they, they want to go to work for organizations that have a purpose and that have a mission that, that they can um, relate to. They, they want to go to work for an organization that has a lot of values, that, you know, it's not just about the bottom line. And, and I think most of them are savvy enough to see that, A, the bottom line is important, but we can we can still make money and we can still um, contribute to society at the same time. So I, I think that's really something important that, that organizations need to look at. You know, and, and another thing that I've been thinking a lot about recently is in your branding, you want to show that you're an organization that's flexible. Um, you you can you can meet change, and you can. Um, adapt to change very quickly. Uh, we, we have seen this now with, with the pandemic, um, companies you know, being forced to basically send everybody home. If, if you're, you know, especially in the professional services field as, as we've all worked in, where there may have been reluctance to allow people to telecommute and work from home, it's like, guess what? It's become almost the new normal. So yet you have to show that you know you will be flexible or at least be be open to hearing new ideas because to me that's one of the lessons that's come out of, of the recent pandemic. And you know, I heard something recently about taking seriously what you hear from, from your younger workers and your younger colleagues because they they may not have a lot of business experience, but they, they bring a lot of other experiences like their ease with working with technology, and, and that can really help to advance your organization. So, so I say, yeah, values, stand behind your values, um, care about the people, and um, just demonstrate a lot of flexibility. If you can incorporate all of that into your brand, I, you know, I, I think you're in a good position to, to attract um, a very strong workforce. And people that'll hang around for a while, yeah, and I like your point you were making about uh, the younger employees and younger talent, which kind of uh, leads into my next question. Do you think that senior managers provide enough consideration when it comes to the relationship between employer brand and talent acquisition? I'd say they've been reluctant to for a long time. I, I think everybody has had a big wake-up call. With, with the way we have had to change and, and change things so so very rapidly. I, I was doing some work with an organization recently and as a result of COVID that you know they suddenly had to to implement some some tools and, and new platforms where, where pe people could start to work remotely in, in in an environment that really wasn't set up to do a lot of remote work. I mean people still had to be at at the place of business, but they figured out some ways to, well, separate some people some so they could interact with the, cu the customers by putting in a virtual assistant. So, you know, the, the customers could come in and they could talk to, to a service representative without being in the same room. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, and I would say there was probably, there was probably a reluctance on their part at, at one point, you know, if, if I'd had that conversation with them a year ago, it would have been, well, uh, uh, no, 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 we can't do that. And all of a sudden it was like, bam, overnight, they had to put something like that in place. So, you know, I, I, I think that there has been a reluctance and, and I think it goes back to, you know, what, what I had just read or heard recently about the, the way we've always done things isn't always the best way. Mm -hmm. And if we're if we are a little bit more flexible, it's easier to you know we may learn that hey we can do things a whole lot more efficiently and you know yes some of the younger talent may have different ideas about how to get things done but you know hey guess what 
it may work. And, you know, the future is theirs anyway, so maybe it's time to start easing into, or in this case, it, we've just had to jump into some of this stuff. And, you know, I, I think you're going to see a lot of organizations doing a lot of reevaluation of, you know, how do we do things and um, how, how do we attract that new talent and, and yet recognize that branding is so important? Well, and I also think there, there are things out there, you know, a lot of senior management teams that I talk to, they try to control every variable. But, you know, nowadays with social media and everything else, you know, that's, you know, impossible to do, especially, uh, you know, with platforms out there like Glassdoor and things like that, where, um, you know, talent can go up and, and read all these reviews and, you know, management really doesn't have any control over that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I heard something else that recently, uh, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of time in the world of compensation, but I'm certainly, um, I certainly understand it. And, you know, what a lot of companies are turning to now is, is you know, platforms like Glassdoor or LinkedIn to say, well, what are these jobs paying? And, you know, and then it begs the question, well, is that viable data, you know, and, and should you be relying on it or relying totally on it? And, right. you know, and like everything else, it, it, there's some positives and negatives. You know, if, if there's a new emerging um, type of a position, you, you're going to get better data out there on some of these platforms than you are going to probably going to get through traditional methods. And, yeah, so, so it's things like that that are totally influencing, and, you know, what, you know, what's happening. And, and you're right, you can't, you can't control social media. You, you can only... Uh, you can only hope that what people are saying on social media about you are the positive things, you know, and because that gets back to the kind of culture you want to create and the kind of brand that you want to have for the organization. But you can't you can't just pay lip service to it anymore. You've really you've really got to live the brand and the values that, that you put in place. It is. I, everyone's got to step up their game a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, a little birdie told me that you're in the process of writing a book. Uh, with an employee relations theme. Uh, how is it different from the other books you've written? It's quite different, actually. Um, you know, the the first four books that we've written have, have been strictly nonfiction. Um, you know, they, they're pretty um, straightforward and to the point. And when we were finishing writing our first book, The Big Book of HR, you know, we put a chapter in there on employee relations. And, and you know, it was, okay, you know, the, the, this is part of what encompasses the whole employee relations function. But in the back of my mind was a question. I, I had taught some classes for a while on, on HR, and somebody said to me, how do you really learn employee relations? And I thought, you know, that's a really good question because it's not like you can just pick up a book and say, how do I deal with some of the situations that come across my desk, which is a, a, a big part of, of what an employee relations professional does. It's not the only part, but it's a big part. And I got this idea, wouldn't it be cool to start to tell stories about workplace challenges? So planted the idea in my co-author's head, and we, we started on this journey eight years ago, collecting stories. And yeah, we collected all the stories, and we got stuff sort of put together, and, and but but then we started going to writing conferences and saying, yeah, you know, we need to tell these stories in a little bit more compelling way. So we had, we really had to learn how to be a different kind of writer because what we put, what, what the book, the genre of the book is really creative nonfiction. So we've taken, we created a backdrop of, of a company that's totally fictitious, fictitious characters and took all of these stories and kind of or that we heard and in some cases had to put them together because you know we wanted to preserve confidentiality in a lot of cases but we also want we wanted to tell some realistic stories and, and put them into realistic situations so we've we've really written a storybook about some of the unbelievable tales that occur in the workplace with with respect to to behavior and it it is it, it will be submitted within the next two weeks to a pub, to a firm that's going to help us. We're going to self-publish this one, and they will help us with printing and getting it to market, and um, you know, get, getting it distributed and everything. And we're looking at a uh, 
a day towards the end of the year, probably just in time for the the Christmas holiday or the, the holidays, you know, around around mid mid November, December first. So hopefully it'll be, you know, if you're ever interested in really what goes on behind the scenes, what are some of those things that employees do <laughs> that that managers and HR professionals need to deal with? We 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 really wanted to enlighten people, and you know. Use it as a teaching tool as well. Well, I'd like to hear about some of those now. You know, <laughs> what are some of the common myths and misconceptions about employee relations? Well, you know, and 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 I think that's that is so true. You know, well, somebody had said to me who who had who had been a beta reader of the book. Well, what you know, what is it that HR people do? And you know, we weren't trying to write about the whole HR function because. What do you just sit around and drink coffee all day until somebody comes with their problems? But you know, I think a big myth about about the field of employee relations is that it's only about solving problems. That that it, you know, you don't really have a whole lot to do until you know somebody comes along and you know there's an attendance problem, there's some other behavioral problem, there's a performance problem with an employee, and and oh, that's when you roll up the sleeves and you get to work. But but you know the Behind that, it's helping the organization to create a culture that uh, that's going to support the employees. So you, know, you, you want to have policies in place and, and develop programs. You know, you, you want to be supporting the managers so that they can be managing their people because it's really the manager's job. Uh, it, it's not HR's job to, to be managing the, uh, the employees, but, but you want to put all the tools and the processes in place for them. It's being proactive, you know. It, it, it's putting some of the the kinds of programs in place, like employee assistance programs. So when when somebody is struggling with a personal problem or even a work related problem, they they have they can go and talk to somebody in a confidential way, and and it's outside of the organization, and and you know, kind of sort through some of the things that 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 are going on in their life. Um, you know, it, it's putting you know. Um, substance abuse programs in place, again, so, so people have a place to go. It's putting pre preventative measures in around, you know, some of the, the big issues that we deal with, like like harassment or, or workplace discrimination. And, you know, I, I see some big challenges now with, you know, more of the heightened awareness, I think, around race-related issues that, that have come up and, you know, and making sure that we do have equity and, and um, diversity within the workforce. And it's more than just, oh, let's make sure we go out and hire a lot of different kinds of people. It's, you know, how do we make sure that they're included and that their voices are heard so that they're contributing to the organization? So a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges involved. Yeah, and I like the comment you made earlier about, you know, getting beyond the lip service. I think that's that's really critical right now. And, and people are going to hold organizations and companies a little bit more accountable. Yeah, you know, I mean, some of the things I've been reading recently, you know, about, oh, uh, you know, let's start doing diversity training. All of a sudden, that, that, you know, in, in the midst of the pandemic, you know, yeah, people are looking for it. And I'm like, well, you know, training, training's good. And, and I've done diversity training, but there's more to it. You're not going to solve that a problem of this magnitude that, that affects all of society just by having everybody sit through an hour training program either. You know, it, companies really have to start seeing what can we do to, to influence our communities. And, 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 you know, I think that, that gets back to what we were saying earlier about how do you brand your organization and what is it that, that the younger employees want? Because they're, they're going to drive this a lot more than, than prior generations have. and and they're going to want to know. No, it, it's not that I just want to walk in here and see, you know, see a bunch of people that don't look like me. What else are you doing, uh, you know, to to influence the community, and and to to you really to drive more social change? Well, I, and I also think there's there's a bigger problem within organizations, and and that is that a lot of people step into new roles or elevated roles, but they really don't have management experience. Um, okay. Yes, <laughs> and I, I can't tell you how many times I ran, I've run into that in my career, where, um, you know, someone was my boss, but they weren't really a good manager or leader, and and that had a, a major major impact on my productivity 
and motivation and, and mm -hmm. everything else. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's, it, 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 you know, and it's funny, I heard some, somebody once said something about, oh, yeah, he used to work for the government, and he said, you know, the, that that was typical in the government. And I said, to, you know, Doug, I've seen that in so many industries. I've seen that throughout my career. You know, it's like, you're a great engineer, so we're going to make you a manager, you know, and it's like, he's got no... He's got no people skills. He doesn't. He doesn't know anything about the rest of the organization. You know, it's just he. He just knows engineering, and and that's it. And and there, there's so much more to managing. You know, when when we were approached to write the manager's answer book, you know, that was one of the things that that they wanted us to do. Is it's not not just focus on people issues. You know, because we've written so many. Well, we've written books on on HR topics for them. But, you know, what else is it that a manager needs to know? And it, 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 there's really a breadth, breadth of knowledge, but, but you're absolutely right. We throw people into these jobs and then say, we don't tell you anything. You know, it's like, we don't tell you how to manage people. We don't tell you how to manage a budget. You know, we don't, we don't tell you how to manage the resources that, that you're going to need, you know, to get the job done. So, it, you know, it's, it, it's really unfortunate that, that, that we see too way too much of that happening. Yeah. And again, like I say, in, in these periods of elevated accountability, I think some of that's going to backfire on, on certain organizations. So. Yeah. 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 You know, and it's interesting, you had mentioned something about, you know, being a leader. My son is a teacher and he teaches at a charter school and they have a new executive director who just started last year. Fortunately, he had, he had worked at the school earlier in his career and then, you know, kind of moved around. And, you know, we we kept saying, you know, this poor guy, because he gets thrown into it year one and, you know, and they shut down at the end of the third quarter and, you know, everybody's suddenly teaching from home. But, you know, Eric was saying yesterday, he said, you know, the thing about him, he said, he, he's not, he, he's not political in nature. He's, he's not out there beating his own drum. But he said, the guy is just so smart. He goes, you know, and he, he's constantly thinking. And I said, well, you know, here's the difference. I said, he is a natural leader. It, 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 Eric said, he go, he said, I'm afraid that they're going to kind of pluck him out of here because people are going to start to see some, some of these natural leadership abilities that, that he's exhibiting. And well, you know, it, it's, uh, it's all going to depend on, on what he wants. But I said, that really is a true leader who, who's sitting there, who's, who's focused on the task at hand, focused on what do I have to do for my organization, uh, you know, or, or my department. And you know, how do, how do I get the best productivity and, and meet, you know, meet all the goals that we have to have to meet versus somebody who, you know, and, and, and who's not willing to, who's willing to go out on a limb, you know, versus somebody who's just, you know, constantly looking for the, you know, that, that next opportunity before they're even settled in, into the opportunity that they're in. And, you know, it's like some of this stuff is, is hard to teach people. You know, so sometimes it just, it, it is innate, but, you know, I, I think organizations need to recognize that, that they've got to give their managers the tools that they need. Um, you, you can't just sort of cut them loose and say, you know, you know go forth and manage. <laughs> you, you, you've, you've got to give them the resources that they need. You know, th these are, call them crazy times, unprecedented times, turbulent times. Um, mm -hmm. Can you share with our audience some of your thoughts about what your perspective of the future work will look like? Yeah, it's, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that recently. And, and you know, it's, I wish I had the crystal ball, but, you, you know, I mean, obviously, in, in particularly in the industries that we work in, in, in professional services, there's probably going to see more of an opportunity for, you know, remote work, distributed workforces. It's like, hey, if this is working, if people don't need to be in the office every day, do I just have to recruit in a certain geographic area? I mean, I can try to find good talent anywhere without relocating people. You know, is, is, is that going to be something that we see as viable in the future? And, you know, it may be, it, it, it you know, very well may be. And, and people can, can stay put in, in areas where they enjoy living. You know, I mean, there's a great job in the city, but I kind of like living in the country. Well, you know, if I only have to go to the city every once in a while, you know, yeah, it's a great job. But 
you know, I see that there's a, there's there's opportunities to create new and innovative ways of doing things. You know, and it, it, it kind of ties back to what we were saying earlier with, you know, respecting some of the perspectives of, of the younger generation because they, they're not afraid of technology. And but but, you know, along with that goes, is there a better way? that we can do the work of the organization, that we can um, support people, that we can turn out our products and services more efficiently and more effectively than, than ways that we've been doing them in the past. I think there's opportunities for everybody to learn some new skills. Uh, and you know, and, and that's a good thing because you know, the, the more we keep learning, the, the more vibrant I think we, we become as a country, um, the more vibrant your organization becomes. And, and I think that's really, really important. And I also think that there's an opportunity for organizations to really start to, to see that we're going to put people first. We're going to make people matter in our organizations rather than just paying lip service. Because we've all, oh, you know, our employees are our most important asset. We've all got to, got so tired of hearing that because it's, you know, again, do you really mean that? <laughs> do you really mean that? But, 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 but I, I think I think this has been an eye opener to say, wait a minute, you know, the leadership doesn't always have all the answers. So so let's start looking to, you know, the people that are out there on the front lines that are doing the work for us, that are making us the money, because that they may have much better ways of doing things and in a much much more cost effective way. You know, everybody's talking about saving real estate costs and it's yeah, yeah. And and then I go, what do we do with all the buildings that are out there? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, but but I see some repurposing of some of that too in, in the future. So I think Amazon will eventually buy all those buildings. So we, you don't have yeah. to worry. Yeah, <laughs> you're probably right. <laughs> um. This has been great, Cornelia. I just uh, have uh, one last question for you. If someone were interested in learning more about or buying uh, your books, uh, where should they go? I would direct them um, first to our uh, our website, which is bigbookofhr.com. We've got links on there to to where you can purchase all of our books, and because they're all available through Amazon, through through Barnes and Noble, and you can also get them through your, your local book bookshops there there's a link there to indiebound.com so you know what whatever your whatever your buying habits are uh we can certainly accommodate them and and then you can also reach us through that website there's a you know a a, a contact form in there and be happy to chat with anyone along the way terrific well i've learned a lot i've taken a lot of notes during this um this uh, conversation so um I'm going to be one of those people that's going to go online and, and look for your book. So thank yeah, you. So that'd much. be great. We'd love that. And I look forward to your uh, your new book coming out. Um, I like the storytelling angle on it. So I'm I'm a big yeah. fan. Yeah. Well, we'll 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 keep you advised. We'll let you know when when it when it hits the marketplace. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, thank you so much for your time and insights. Thank you very much, Kelly. It's been a pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.